Okay, well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's so great to be back in Sydney. We're <laughs> loving it. Today was Coogee Bay, Coogee Beach, and yeah. Walking around the streets of Sydney, cafes, going to the cinema, checking out Doctor Strange again. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been just a beautiful day. And I guess you were over driving through the streets of Sydney in a bus, taking care of practicalities. Mm-hmm, yeah. And then coming back to the same block I, I used to live in this very building. Um, how many years ago? Nine Seven. years ago? Seven years ago. 2007, 2007, so nine years ago. Yeah, about nine years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know too, because can, can you hear Francis and I okay? Or you hear Francis? Okay, that's good. Oh, hello there. Well, we're so grateful that you all came, and and always our our topic is our life. We just are living a very happy, joyful, gleeful life of forgiveness, of practical forgiveness, of living in purpose, and letting the purpose guide and bringing forth lots and lots of miracles, daily miracles, that are, are part of gliding along with spirit and living above the battleground, living beyond the, the struggles and temptations of the ego that always is trying to ensnare our mind into conflict and challenge and struggle. And that is what a death wish does. A death wish <laughs> tries to stir things up and keep your mind mixed. And. A death wish in the mind is just there to present a temptation to serve two masters. And most people are familiar. I see the, the book of mystical teachings of Jesus down there. And, and Jesus said 2,000 years ago uh, that you cannot serve two masters. And you could say that you cannot serve both love, which is who you are, and fear, which is fiction, it's make-believe, it's, uh, it's an artificial intelligence, if you could even use the word intelligence. <laughs> Fear doesn't really have any intelligence, but it's definitely artificial, and it's an artificial emotion, even though it it's, seems very, very real in all of its derivatives in this world. Uh, it doesn't have a, an actual basis in reality. And so... Uh, as the Beatles sang, all you need is love, that was very profound. I think they were sages in many ways, uh, or at least channeling some very amazing teachings. And, um, and our focus is always not so much on things of the world, because I know there's a lot of events happening now, there's been a lot of stir and buzz around things like uh, the United States election, and there's a lot of emotions being stirred up and topics that are springing off of that in many ways, but we don't really gear our gathering so much to current events or worldly affairs as the day-to-day workings of the mind, and living in such a way that you're living in clarity and purpose, and it's such a good habit. You're miracle-minded that that miracle-mindedness carries you through every day and every every experience that you have, it like lifts your minds, it lifts it up. Oh, come on, come on in. We need a Sorry, place, no, oh, we need a place for this gentleman to sit down. Do we have any chairs left or we could shuffle, maybe, yeah, you could maybe sit down. Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There's a, excuse me. Oh, there's a chair here. So I just get on the cushion. So, 
That's what we are really here to talk about is practical spirituality. Is living it day by day and there are very interactive uh, sessions that we have based on questions and concerns and issues and whatever is going on on a daily basis. Wow, we're <laughs> our door is getting... <laughs> we did say that if it started to fill up, we also have some room out there on the patio, so you might have to open up the... There's two more behind me as well. There's another two coming. Oh, there's another two coming. <laughs> that was our... Do we, do we want to open up the patio out there, or is it it's too difficult to hear, probably? Okay. Okay, very good. So, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, so I, I think that's the key, you know, sometimes even in our lives when we started to get stirred up and darkness started to arise, that's where we started to remember to call on the spirit or to call on help or how do we forgive in this particular situation and I guess the message that we really want to bring is that you know we want to form a habit that is so solid that it's actually changed the direction of our daily thinking from a problem focused thinking from this habit of judging and attacking and categorization, you know, looking at situations to a direction of thinking of miracle-minded thinking, always seeking the answer instead of focusing on the problem. Like San- Sanjeev actually said, when we just finished a retreat in Maji, a seven-day retreat, he actually said that David, when he, David walked into his life, um, half a year ago, he started to see the difference of spirituality and a spirit-led life, because that is the message. You know, we want to start to give our life, give our decisions, and give our mind to be directed by the spirit, and form such a good habit that no amount of worldly events and perception feels different to any other. You know, it becomes an ongoing, you know, reminder of whether I want to be right about the perception or judgment or I want to be happy. You know, that is the habit that we, we're here just to share with everyone that is possible. And the point of A Course in Miracles and really the point of all spirituality is to not try to bring spirit into your human perception of the world, but to always bring your human perception of the world and its thoughts and beliefs to the light with an attitude of show me, take me higher, reveal to me, show me the way. Because when we try to bring God into the world, or we try to bring God into our perception, of the world, it always is going to be difficult because you can't bring the truth into illusion and you can't bring light into darkness. Even though there have been times when we were taught about bringing the kingdom to heaven to earth and that sounds good, it sounds helpful, but really the only way that you can experience the kingdom of heaven is by actually giving up all thoughts and beliefs and perceptions that you have about this world. So when I say a life that's inspired and given over, the, the, the issue with people practicing A Course in Miracles is, is this deeply ingrained attempt to use everything, books, teachings, relationships and everything, to make a better self, to have a better life in this world. And there comes a point in working with any authentic spirituality, including A Course in Miracles, where you start to realize that you've got to go much deeper than trying to improve the human condition. Uh, as much as that can seem like a very uh, high goal, and we've certainly tried for many generations, with, we've tried it with education, uh, we've had you know, many decades of educational reforms, and 
yet we have pretty much the same problems on planet Earth that we had before those educational reforms. Uh, even though uh, we've practiced, there's been many spiritualities that have been practiced for many years, the same conflicts keep repeating over and over like Groundhog Day. They keep looping around. And it's almost uh, to the point where humans can start to get a little depressed because it doesn't seem like we're making much of a dent. I've even had people as I go around the world and they ask me, do you think the world's getting better? Or is it getting worse? They're not even sure <laughs> with the life conditions of this world and watching everything that's occurring, including the election that just happened and everything where uh, in, in different countries building up armaments and moving tanks to the borders and, and taking over aspects of, of countries or land. You know, the same issues that have been going on for thousands of years are still with us and it doesn't seem to be making a dent in it and it's because the world is a perception and the only way we can change our perception of the world is from the inside out we have to have a purification of our hearts like Jesus taught blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God it was a, a purification from within that's required for many people that seems daunting, like a daunting task, because anybody who's even attempted behavior modification, who's had an addiction to drinking, alcohol, or drugs, or various patterns, they know that, that behavior modification it doesn't come easy. And changing the thinking that's underneath the behaviors is, seems to be even more difficult because it seems to be more deeply rooted, like there's some very, very deep roots that are underneath those thoughts. There's belief roots that go way down, very deep. There's an unworthiness feeling, a darkness that's down there, and you might say all of the human condition seems to be an attempt to overcome deep-seated feelings of worthlessness and helplessness. How deep-seated are we talking? Well, what's the number one killer in the world? It's suicide. Is it? Yes. Suicide is the number one cause of death on this planet. So there's the deep depression and there's some very deep psychological darkness that's underneath. And now we have a teaching like A Course in Miracles that is saying, well, yeah, you have to go through the darkness to the light. You, you have to allow that repressed, suppressed darkness to come up into awareness. Why does that seem so difficult is because when you begin to do that, your life can seem to be so dysfunctional and you can seem to seem so out of whack and there's concerns that you won't be able to function and survive as a human being because you're opening a psychological can of worms. And many people who, over the years, even the saints and mystics uh, like St. John of the Cross who wrote The Dark Night of the Soul, opened that lid and then went, oops. <laughs> yeah. And their whole lifetime was gnashing of teeth. And they wrote about it. They called it the dark night of the soul. But this dark night of the soul went on for more than a, a couple of weeks or months. This was, they had opened up a can of worms that was years of suffering. And for most human beings, it's like, no, thank you. If that's the case, not in this lifetime. I think I'll go back to the old standby, eat, drink, and be merry, for one day we shall die. Uh, that seems better than intense emotional pain that, that seems to have no end. It's like turning on the waterworks and having your waterworks turn into Niagara Falls or Iguazu. <laughs> and whoa, <laughs> that's a little bit of an overwhelm. So what we are here for to share is, is that journey where about 30 years ago, A Course in Miracles came into my life and basically I was not scared of it. I was actually lit up by it and it felt like an, an answer to all my prayers every time I opened the book and it continued to be that way and it took me in deeper and deeper and there were times when I felt like I was holding on to Jesus and going down the rabbit hole like uh, Alice went through and I just was like, oh my God, I can't, 
I'm breaking up. I can't go any deeper. Like I'm holding on to his cape. It's like Neo or Superman going down through the rabbit hole of the mind. And it was like, whoa, it's very intense. But I did hold on to that cape and, and because I had asked for that. I had said early on that there was something fishy about this world and I wanted to know what was beyond this world and I was taken into revelatory experiences where the world disappeared three different times and, and ultimately taken on a journey where I thought Jesus has said in the Course, this Course will be believed entirely or not at all. And that didn't scare me either because I basically said, well okay then, not at all is not an option. I'm not going to do all this for a not at all at the end. It has to be for believed entirely. It's, it's something that is so direct, it's like I sometimes I say it's like it's like getting your whiskey or your vodka direct instead of on the rocks. No ice, not diluted, it's just super, super direct. And so for those that hang with it, they obviously have got something in their soul that's saying this is a wake-up lifetime. And for people who I work with and I live with and everything, that is a common feeling of that this is it. Uh, however you want to construct whatever this is it means, like this is, I will make the full attempt. I will give everything I've got because this is the most important thing. Peace of mind, eternal peace of mind is more important than anything else that glimmers in, in the world. Trinkets from the world, eternal life. Okay, trinkets, <laughs> eternal life, and then after a while, eternal life, eternal life. You know, you, it, you, it's still a bit of double vision. You know, it's not. If you've been at this for millennium, you know, it's not that you rise up immediately. Ah, uh, oh, eternal life. You know, there's. Jesus says, those who have been prisoners in the darkness. Uh, do not, do not spring up from their chains. Um, and, and even their eyes, they've been sleeping and dreaming for a long, long time. Even their eyes, as they begin to know His purpose and know God's will, even their eyes are still closed. Eyelids are still closed. But a smile has come on their sleeping faces. <laughs> they've still got the rim going, <laughs> still watching the world. Watch the world, but a smile has come on their sleeping faces. In the workbook he says, their forehead is serene. He's, he's giving indicators, still using body symbols, that, that there's glee and joy and happiness and stability coming, even though they're still sleeping. They're coming into a happy dream after many, many dark dreams. And you don't wake up without a happy dream. You don't transition to eternity without a happy dream first. That makes sense. If you were going from nightmares, you come into happy dreams, non-judgment, and then you awaken from the dream of this world. So, that's what we're here for. We're here to share of our lives and share of our daily miracles and guidance and I remember too, this coming to mind, one time I, I had a friend of mine, Lisa, and she said, she kept saying, I want to take a trip with you, I want to take a trip with you, and so I said, okay, I'll meet you at the Philadelphia airport on such and such a day, and we'll fly to Arizona, and, and I said, is there anything else you want other than this trip, and she said, I, I would like to have a meal with you before we fly. And I said, okay, that's a, a trip and a meal. And we ended up having a glorious trip, even though we uh, we got to the airport, the flight crew didn't show up, the, the flight we were supposed to take was canceled, they gave us vouchers for a free meal together, they put us on a different airplane uh, to fly us to Phoenix and uh, I think it was Phoenix and, and then it was we basically said are you really uh, 
set on it. And I said, no, I, I could fly to another city. I just, I'm going to Arizona. I just, you could do that, got it on to a different city. Uh, and it went on and on, a miraculous series of events where I didn't really have any kind of parameters on how it was supposed to go, except that we would be flying together to Arizona and having a meal. And we had so much fun. We kept getting upgrades and honeymoon suite and all kinds of things, uh, free, free meals and everything thrown in as we were just like children playing with Jesus and flowing in the joy of the moment. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, even though there still may be some things like us arranging this gathering, your life becomes an open slate. You basically are saying to the Spirit, Mm-hmm. Let's have some fun. Let's extend the joy. Let's extend the love and light. And then you receive the guidance of and the instructions and everything. You receive all the props and everything to make a happy expression of love and light. Without having all these expectations, without having your whole life planned out, without having everything set. Uh, your day is not all planned out, you know, like a, like one of these planners where you've got to be here at 8 and here at 9.30 and so on and so forth. It's much more of a spontaneous flow in which you are happily greeting what comes your way, whatever it is, mm. and without judgment, so that that's the key to to the happiness, is not, not having all these rigid, set expectations that are based on a false self-concept that God did create. Yeah, because I think that the thing is, you know, for all of us who already started A Course in Miracles, we know it is in a way an escape patch from, you know, whatever pain and suffering and anything. I, I think I started the course with a very particular hope or wish that this can help me to see through the physical illness and heal it because I was basically battling with the, the, the fear of my father dying at the time and there was physical symptoms of my own body and and then when I flipped through this book and I saw the lesson and the sentence that caught my eye was something to the extent that you know, if you don't see the purpose of the illness, it will not be there anymore. And that was so complete for me. It's not like you can heal this symptom through this diet, but there is still a possibility of sickness. This book, just something that cut through, was so so direct and so ultimate for me to see even one sentence like that about a problem that I had at the moment. But with that openness to get into this book, what really happened was a journey that the Spirit was basically saying, you have no clue what causes any problem or suffering in your life. You have no clue what you want, actually. And I'm going to show you something that's so beyond your horizon and so beyond your thinking of what are the problems and what are the solutions. And we're going on this journey that's going to transcend everything, everything as you know it. So it was such an amazing journey that was not able to be done by the logical thinking mind, by the mind that that was, you know, used to learn through book study and talk about concepts. So this is such a journey of completely transcend everything that even with when we're reading the book, what we think we're reading, what we think we understand. So when we started to really allow our lives to be a life of this journey, then everything started to unfold in a way as the Spirit wants us to to, to know, you know, there is so, so much that's going to be unfolding for us as a result of the expansion of our mind and our awareness with his guidance. So 
this is the bigger context of what is really happening. We're not really here to talk about solving a specific issue or solving about a specific problem, handling this or handling that. What we are saying is the spirit is really wanting to give us everything, absolutely everything. And it's a very practical path. This is a very, very practical path. What is happening is that we have to give our life over to allow the spirit to guide us so that our lives can be used to unfold in a way that we, are, we can be convinced. And of course, along this journey, as we're embracing the spirit, as we're embracing the purpose of forgiveness, then what David was just talking about, this spontaneity and the flow and the joy would just come miracles, becomes a daily experience. But this experience is not something we, we can direct with our logical thinking mind. These are natural byproducts. When we started to say yes to the spirit, we say, okay, you have a plan for me to unfold and let my life be used for this purpose of opening my mind up. It's not for a purpose of anything for this body to be, you know, achieving anything, but let my life be used to open my mind up, to be on a journey with you. And this is what is unfolding, you know, for us on a daily basis, just like a wonder, like a wonder child, just watching how the spirit is helping us to mm-hmm. open our mind up. Yeah, one thing that Frances told me was that she she said uh, that deep inside in her heart, she had this thought she. She enjoyed travel. She enjoyed uh, going to around the world and seeing wonderful places, meeting wonderful people, uh, staying at wonderful places, and so on and so forth. And this isn't that uncommon for a lot of people. Uh, She had this in her heart. She thought, this is the kind of life that I want. And there was a formula in there for doing it. And and most everybody can agree that you can have this kind of idea but you also have ideas of of the means and she felt she would work hard and she would climb the ladder of success at at her her business and then she would own her own business and then she would be so successful at owning or running her own business that you can set your own Hours, and if you're really successful, then you develop a nest egg. Which, of course, if you talked about people and the ways of the world, this is a common thing. This isn't just one or two people that have this in mind. She would develop it to such a sense that she would retire, if it really went well, retire early. Isn't this how the formula goes? That's, that's part of the upward mobility and the drive to success because you know you go well if this goes if this goes even better than your own business set your own hours retire early and then you've got what the means to travel around the world meet exciting people stay at exciting places and do all the things uh, and and so that was her plan Jesus had a different plan uh, he said yeah I can get you all that and we don't need the, the nest egg part. Uh, we don't need all the years of hard work and we don't need the, the business ding, 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 hitting that. We don't need those aspects. I can give you all of that um, without all those years or decades of the striving and struggling, which pokes a hole in the whole formula. It's almost like saying you are entitled to a joyful life but as far as the determining the means, uh, you have to leave that to me. And it was very similar to what I was hearing because uh, I so opened my heart up that uh, the Course in Miracles came to me when, I, when the body of David seemed to be in its tw- late 20s. And so by my late 20s, I 
had tapped into my connection with Jesus and, and it, it was growing so rapid and so strong that it was quickly taking over my life. It was the guiding force. Instead of uh, Pinocchio had Jiminy Cricket as the consciousness, I had Jesus Christ as <laughs> my, my little voice, or almost like a little bird on the shoulder and it's chirping in your ear. With specific things, not just I love you. I love you always, even until the end of time, but turn left, call so-and-so. You can leave that behind. I said leave it behind. Uh, you forgot your keys. You know, practical stuff. <laughs> not just I love you, I love you, I love you, but it really, like really good, good practical advice. And so at that point, uh, I have to say that it was going so well there in my late 20s that and he had spoken to me about he said you will not have you will not have a career in this lifetime and I was just like what? you know especially when you're 20s you know that's your parents aren't telling you that for sure and your colleagues and your people at university why are they at university getting all the degrees for the career, you know, that was kind of a, whoa, and he said, and I will guide you, I still had, you know, student loans to pay off, I still had wound myself in a bit to the ego's world, but he was rapidly unwinding me from that, so that, yeah, by the late, late uh, 20s, I actually started to consider early retirement, and, and I had no savings, <laughs> that's, not the formula. <laughs> you, you are Looney Tunes if you <laughs> are considering early retirement. You haven't done, crossed all your T's, dotted all your I's, and had all that in place. You know, your parents would tell you, yeah, this is downright crazy. If, you know, you just need to change your mind or get locked up <laughs> or fall through the cracks and learn the hard way. But actually, with, with that strong connection with Jesus, I was feeling like, here we go. Whoa, because he was, he was already saying to me during those years, like, uh, after he guided me through a series of, of work experiences to knock the chip of pride off the, off the shoulder, to, knock, to knock, the, knock the pride out of me in a pretty rapid way. Uh, when that started to happen, and when the student loans started to get paid off and everything, then I started to hear, now you're mine. Almost like and I will use you in ways that you can't even imagine. So don't even ask me about the future. Don't ask for a five-year plan or a two-year plan or a two-month plan. I will use you completely, day by day, in a way that will bless the entire universe and it will be a, a lifetime for, for the entire universe, for the whole cosmos, actually, and as his lifetime had been. And so... Uh, that's why I, I had to rapidly consider uh, early retirement. But I wasn't so much retiring from the world of images because my eyes, I, I started to get some smiles on my sleeping face with all the miracles that were happening. But the, the eyes weren't open. I was still perceiving a world. I was perceiving men and women and trees and mountains. And I was still seeing a world. I had a few uh, revelatory experiences with the whole world disappeared. The universe had disappeared a few times for me, going into deep meditation and going into the light that they talk about in the near-death experiences. I, would, I went right into the light and the whole world was gone. So I knew that the world was a veil, but, but Jesus was like, yeah, and there's a lot to come. So don't think, I was thinking after I got the course, I would just go, point me in the mountain you want me to go to and I will ascend. And it's like I had a chorus of angels all laughing. <laughs> he thinks he's at the end. <laughs> the angels were all laughing. You're at the beginning. <laughs> you think you're at the end, but you're not. But I was getting happier rapidly, uh, and, and an intrinsic happy, happiness, not like happiness because of a job promotion or an event in the world. Who won the election? That was not <laughs> the kind of happy, you know. It was coming bubbling from inside. But it was from a purpose. And so I did have to make a decision to give it all over 
almost like a conversion experience, like, okay, I will put you in charge. I do trust you. I will let go of my fears of the future and my concerns that I'll be a bag lady uh, scrounging for something in the streets or, you know, homeless. Uh, you know, those, those are very strong thoughts in, in your 20s <laughs> when you're considering such a, a drastic leap. I can't say that they weren't there. They, they came like heavy clouds a lot. Like, are you crazy? And I, I of course, I, I expressed it to Jesus. I would say, I would say, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, Jesus. I can't just go out and scoop up a bunch of bills off a tree in the backyard. He'd say, yeah, I know, you believe that. That's how he would answer me, you believe that. Money doesn't grow on trees. And, but he would say, but I will provide for you if you will do my work. And, and of course, I was raised Christian. You know, the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil. You know, it, there was plenty of verses from the Bible where he was pointing out divine providence. And it, it was a little shocking that he was talking divine providence to me because I, I thought of divine providence. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the stuff of the apostles. Yeah, yeah. St. Francis, yeah, I've heard of that divine providence. Mother Teresa, yeah. David? <laughs> what? Wait. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's, we always have difficulty transferring things to accept it for our own mind. You know, it's always great to see the avatars and the saints, but to accept that the same divine providence that's existed all along, really for all human beings, they can fool themselves into thinking they're, they're sustaining themselves through work and jobs and careers, but that's a trick. That's just a mesmerism of thinking that we are in charge of our own destinies and and of course in this day and age we have a lot of examples where people work sometimes for decades for a company and then their pension disappears. Uh, a friend of mine, her, her father, his entire pension was stolen by something and, and, and those kind of things are pretty common in this day and age where you have no guarantees. There's a lot of examples of pensions and uh, companies just going kaput. You know, but for me, I really had to have that trust to go for it. And, and I would say that with Frances, that was the same way, that, that she started to have those strong feelings. And then after we met, I guess we met, was it here mm -hmm. in Sydney? And then you came up to Noosa and then down to Kangaroo Valley. Yeah. And then uh, she started coming around to all my gatherings, whether they were here in Australia or other place, and we do seem to have some, some groupies actually in the house today. It's not, this isn't a new phenomenon. Phenomena. <laughs> They've been following us from, what is Melbourne, it, Melbourne, Melbourne to Mudgee, to, to Sydney. What's next? <laughs> Where are you going next? <laughs> but Francis did that. She followed me around Australia, like really, like shattered me around, and then all of a sudden it was actually. Sweden, Utah, Sweden, Croatia, Spain. Utah, Sweden, Spain. There was just a bunch of them in there. But that was after you had this kind of deep, kind of conversion experience. And she had loud voices. I mean, a lot of experiences with voices speaking to her and confirmations and and things. Even when we were down in Kangaroo Valley where we, she said, I want a one-on-one. -on -one. We were having a one-on-one -on -one and I was speaking to her and I just looked into her eyes and she was hearing this inner voice that was was talking about me while I was talking to her. <laughs> but that's how Jesus works. It, it's a, it takes major confirmations for us to take such major leaps. Or that time when you knew that you were to stay in Australia until something big would happen and then it was a very loud voice. It was a loud voice basically because I had the question in my mind of what was the purpose of me being here, living here and um, whether I should consider some opportunities overseas for work and the voice just fill up the sky saying stay and you have a very big thing that's going to happen for you and I 
it was so natural. It was the most natural experience that I never questioned or thinking that was anything strange to me. And I actually look up to the sky and said, okay, because the voice was so loud and it was so affirmative. And only after five years from that place, from that day, I actually moved out of Australia, went to the United States, and I realized that was the big thing that I was waiting for. Then I started to talk about the story. I started to realize, oh, that was a weird experience. How do I talk to people? But never a day in that five years, while well, I heard it and I was waiting, and I was waiting for that day to happen, I had any feeling that was a weird experience. It was actually the most like most natural experience that happened to me. Some, someone tell me, very authoritative, but very gentle and clear and loud that wait. And there is a big, big thing, big plan for you unfolding. And I have to say as well for... You can come in. <laughs> for David, you know, he seemed to to have all these years with Jesus in his mind, such a strong connection and clear guidance that comes through him, that guided him to, to have this transformation on his own for quite some time. But for me, I felt like I took a much easier way because I felt like Jesus sent, sent me so many mighty companions from the moment that I heard that voice and he basically didn't say you need to do anything he just said wait mm. so I just waited and I didn't really you know it's not very hard to wait here in Australia you know like just like <laughs> okay I, I couldn't leave I didn't want to leave I'm here and I wait mm. for it to happen but there was many many events happened including the, the course came to my life after that but I Every step along the way, I remember that instruction, and I check in, is this the thing you asked me to wait for? And I was, no, 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 till that moment when David came to my life and when I made the decision, this, this is what I want, and I'm going to take off. That's what the word that I, I actually said. I'm, I want to fly with you, metaphorically and physically, like literally. Like I want my life to start to take off truly, from this moment, not just survival, not just managing, living in pain and you know suffering or problems of relationships, marriage, and any of that. I want to take off from this moment, and that was when when the guidance started to really become crystal clear to me that go and leave. And when I made my made my decisions, I checked with this feeling. It became a habit for the five years. I check in every time when something happens. Is this what I'm waiting for? And, and then after five years, finally I got, yes, that is, the time here is, is maximized. Now move. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Come on in. <laughs> There is a destiny. Everyone comes on the perfect time. Everyone who is to be here is here. Everyone who's not to be here is not here. Nobody else is coming on. We'll we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> there's a thing, you know. There's a thing that that human beings ponder a lot of times is destiny. I, I remember I was in academia university for 10 years and I did dip through conservatory of music and design art and architecture and engineering and I went through all the things and I, I, I went through philosophy too and when I was in philosophy I noticed there was this long running debate over many centuries of free will versus determinism how much of this life is is destined to coming through a door at a particular time you know and how much of it is is, is it at all random? Is there any uh, kind of uh, free will involved? And so that's a major philosophical question, free will versus determinism. And Jesus actually addresses that. He says in the Course, 
of course in miracles in clarification of terms he says you have free will in heaven you have free will in eternity so we were created with free will we got that one right our will is to be perfectly happy forever that was God's gift you know here I create you as happiness and you will remain happy forever and ever and ever and ever Amen <laughs> that's, that's free will Free will doesn't have anything to do with choice. That was the issue. That philosophy gets stuck on free will versus determinism. It's basically, they're stuck on choice versus determinism. And, and that, speaking of elections, which is a decision, voting, those are great topics, and choice. Human beings pride themselves on choice. Human beings would get a little bit nervous if there was a voice that said uh, you really don't have any choice Ooh, that's not what it is to be a human being I have rights, I have abilities and choice is one of them the ego, Jesus says, guards its choice mechanism very tightly and actually the destiny the determinism, the script is written, is all the way it is. Everything in time and space, down to every little nuance and breath, is part of a prearranged plan that actually is over and done. And Jesus says, You are just reliving it as if it's still happening, but it's actually over and gone. And beyond over and gone, it actually never was. But he's giving us a few bones to chew on uh, there. And so it's like, whoa, is that, is that different from the human awareness? That th this world is the past. That's lesson number seven from the workbook. I see only the past. I perceive only the past. You're, you're perceiving with the five senses a world that's over and gone. You're perceiving a little gap where you still believe there's separation and that gap has already been healed. The love and the light have flowed over that gap long ago. He even says this world was over long ago. So it's, it's like a Groundhog Day, still reliving that ancient moment of, of the belief in separation when it's actually healed and gone. Now that means we can really rest and get into our purpose because the only way we'll have that experience is through our purpose. We're not going to achieve it through physical means. We're not going to achieve it through doings or attainments. You know, even sometimes enlightenment is seen as some kind of attainment, but some of you have read Byron Katie, Loving What Is. What is is, is spirit, it's love. We need to come into a recognition and acceptance of that love. It's not a matter of doing something to get out of this world, but it's more of letting ourselves be done through. And Jesus says, you cannot wake yourself, but you can allow yourself to be awakened. That surrender, that allowance, we all know in our hearts that's, that's the way. We have to kind of, we have to get our hands off the steering wheel. And we have to get into the passenger seat. And we have to let the spirit take the wheel. It's a song, Carrie Underwood, Jesus Take the Wheel. Or some of our friends down here know uh, Grego's song, You Drive. Holy Spirit, you drive, I'll ride. You drive, I'll ride. You know, it's, a, it's the passenger, it's being taken on a journey by the Spirit who knows the way to unwind, to transcend, to lift us up. Love lift us up where we belong. <laughs> you know, it, all of our songs are hitting us. I mean, all these poets and songs, and it, we're, being, we're being serenaded by eternity. And, and we do get plenty of glimmers of that. We get those glimmers of joy. We get those heart resonance feelings like yeah here we go yeah okay I'm coming get me in the tractor beam and beam me up you know that's what we want so but this thing of choice is, is very important because we have to 
surrender our egoic choices and our egoic belief in the value of choice. Because, because the ego made up choice, in, in heaven it's just pure oneness, in nirvana it's just pure oneness. There is no, there's not two. And if you don't have two, you don't have choice. So you can see where this is going. It's going back to choiceless awareness. We're going back into bliss. We're going back into isness. I like that word, isness. <laughs> what do you believe in? I believe in isness. <laughs> Or Kenny Loggins, I believe in love, I do. You know, we have to come back into that isness. And, and the only way we do that is we actually have to surrender over our choice mechanism and that the prayer of our heart becomes, Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. You've got to guide my daily choices. You've got to guide me out of the maze. If I'm in a maze, I need to be guided out. If I'm in a labyrinth, I need to find... <laughs> The exit. Uh, I need help to, if I'm circumscribed by false beliefs that tell me I'm a human being and I'm a coordinate point in time and space, which is the farthest thing from the truth, but if I believe that's my reality, I'm going to need help to become aware that I'm formless, that I, I'm actually everywhere, that I actually have no limits, that I was created without limits that I'm not some little bit, tiny bit of consciousness that occupies a little point in the cosmos of time and space. I'm actually much more than that. But I need an actual experience of that. So our experience has been in that joining. We, we have been used in that, that greater purpose. And we have had a sense that there is a greater destiny and that this destiny is far beyond human aspirations or human conception or human imagination. You know, it goes way beyond all of that. And, and there's also a feeling that the, the only way you can completely rest content and happy and joyful is to be completely surrendered over to the divine will. Mm -hmm which is not a scary thing at all. Divine will is, God's will for you is perfect happiness. What's the big deal about surrendering and merging <laughs> into perfect happiness? Unless you believe in guilt, unless you believe you're unworthy, unless you believe in sin, unless you believe in error, you know, those things would, would be a, an, uh, something blocking you. Just, just sharing from what you just said, complete surrender to the Holy Spirit. And uh, example is right now, today, with me. Now, as you know, today was a uh, fan was supposed to be here with me. But instead of that, it's a miracle that my friend, <laughs> who I call my friend now, my, my son is here with me. Now, how did that happen? That's a miracle to me. I wouldn't have, even till one o'clock, I had no such plan that he's going to be here with me, listening to you. Mm -hmm. Now, the total surrender to spirit in my way of practical is that I could see since this morning that Pam's energy was not there to go this evening. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was listening to my spirit and my spirit was saying, go, you go. And, you know, about 1.30 or so I got an SMS from him. He wanted to catch up with me for dinner and I said, well, I'm going to Kuji anyway. I can catch you in the city. We can have a dinner. And uh, then then I said, I'm going to be with David. He said, well, I'm not doing anything. I'll come along with you. Now, that is, that is absolutely a practical example in my life of live, living my life by spirit. Yeah. And <laughs> what's going to happen? Now, I, if I had listened to my ego choice, I would have probably said, no, our parents not going, I'm not going to go out. So who's going to drive by myself for 40 minutes and then look for parking for half an hour? Egoistic <laughs> 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 stuff, right? <laughs> 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 so this boy was with me. He was able to hold the car there for five minutes. I was able to get the suitcase. That's teamwork. Yeah. Very good. A lot of teamwork there. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and uh, a beautiful divine joining. And isn't the destiny idea? Now here we, we keep meeting. We I came here, I stayed at your house, yeah. and I got to meet your son, and 
had your wife, and then we met again up in this little farm town uh, up there on the other side of the Blue Mountains. And we, so it's beautiful. There's a destiny, you know. It's we keep meeting happily. And I asked him, he moved, he moved everything on a ship. Since we moved down, I moved down again. Nothing much was last time. Independence, freedom, parents that have plugged me when I get home late, I guess. <laughs> that was a big leap. Yeah, it was a big leap. Yeah. It always is a big leap for all of us to move. The best thing from that was I was working like in like a frontline role, but now I'm working in like a better role. I guess that independence gave me more drive in life to make myself more sort of valuable to the marketplace, and therefore I got a promotion. So yeah. That's one sort of like. Up, I guess. Yeah. And and feeling more and more like you, you can be intuitive and trust that intuitive self and yeah. glorious things come from being intuitive. Yeah, but I still like to be spoiled by that. <laughs> <laughs> well your meeting your mom and dad was a beautiful time. I remember coming to Sydney and uh, and doing a gathering uh, over there at, at their house and and then Having such a good time, I don't, I don't think you were studying the course, but you had all, all kinds of interest in non-duality, and I said, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I just did such a delightful man. I could talk to him for weeks and months, and just had so much fun. In fact, after I left your house, I would go on, and I always share with people when I have. I said, oh, that was, I had so much fun there, and 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 mentioned that, and then in coming back. Uh, it was actually Francis, because uh, we had, you know, uh, uh, we were coming off of a world tour with China and Japan, and and then uh, going down to Melbourne, and then we had Mudgy Plan, and then Francis said, "Well, I do want to go stay at Begit's house, and I and I her apartment, and I and I have to handle some things with my passport and with my visa, and so so I said, oh, I, that'd be fun to have a." Uh, a gathering in Sydney, and then you and Pam flashed to mind, and then and Robert uh, came to mind when I was joining with Mel, and so it all just kind of flashes out. Even it just was, it just felt like and we were, yeah, that feels good, and it all just kind of flashes in. But it's very quantum. It's like it's everything in our world, everything we experience is is there, not at random, but but it's all a reflection. And the, and the thing is, it's so joyful and it's fun. You just, you just don't know what's down the road, and it's always a, always something joyful given to you by the spirit. Yeah. Initially, it may appear, oh yeah, but if you just push yourself a bit, there's, a, there's a, you know, yeah, an ocean of bliss waiting for you. You know, it's like, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah life becomes to me, it's like life becomes a happy song. I'm just, I just have a happy tune. It's just always going on, just like when you're in a building with elevator music. I've got Jesus is, is like DJing. He's just for like 25, 30 years now DJing in my mind. And that story you were sharing yesterday or day before with the, in America, where the time collapsed. Same thing happened to me when I drove from home. Normally in the evening, as you know, Friday evening would take easily 15 minutes to go to city. It took me 30 minutes, and I had to wait for him to join. And then when we, he said, I want Thai food. And we first restaurant, once we got out of the Thai food. And right opposite, the parking starts at 6 o'clock. And at my what? 6. <laughs> <laughs> so, how spirit arranges all that, one thing after it, you just have to do. Believe in me, guys, if you just leave it like that, life becomes this job. Yeah. It just happens, it's arranged. A joyful adventure. Yeah, I love this thing. What's the song now, Jesus? We sang in the sunshine. We laughed every day. We sang in the sunshine. Then I was on my way. That's it. That's the that feeling. That's the kind of songs. He's DJing in my mind all day long. He's got a great <laughs> repertoire of songs. Always, you know. It's just always song, song, song. Off today, we were off with with Robert. Off to 
Kuji, Kuji Beach, walking down the street and and all the cafes and all the shops and ooh, we just, ooh, we love this vibe and ooh, I love this street. I've never been on that, that main street and going down, 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 then down to the beach and the, the walk, boardwalk down there and the cafes. But it's just all a backdrop. It's just very, very, very joyful. That's all really we're meant to have is, is gratitude, singing the praise to our Creator, singing like the birds sing. I come, every time I come to Australia, you know how the birds are done. They, they, they sing and they squeak and they squawk and they laugh and they do all kinds of things. It's very expressive. To me, that's the joy of God, expressing. You have that with the birds all around. I mean, I've been on trips along the coast. One time I was up the Sunshine Coast and we pulled over and we were just having a, a chat and a big flock of birds came into the trees and they were so happy and so loud that we were like, we, you could not, we could not have a conversation. And I loved it. I was like, oh, loud, happy birds. So loud and so happy that I can't even speak and I will cease to speak. I will cease to try to speak. Because I was appreciating the energy of, of all these b very loud birds, you know. We don't get that. I haven't had the pleasure of that in my travels in other parts of the world. You come to appreciate everything as, as all things are echoes of the voice for God. That, that full appreciation. Love cannot be far behind a thankful heart and a grateful mind. It's a grateful heart and a thankful mind, I think. It's all the same to me. <laughs> but it's really that appreciation, you know, just to feel that. And, and to let your life be guided, you know, that's why we connect with Source. You know, I was saying the other day that Einstein was such an amazing mind, and Einstein is kind of pretty rare, you know, to find a genius scientist who believes in God. That's <coughs> kind of cool. He had this very strong faith in God, and yet he was top of the, you know, he was way seemingly beyond all the scientists of his time, or even of modern times. He was just so, and yet, scientist, scientific mind, and huge faith in God. And it, even for Einstein, though, he was opening, 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 because as his life went along, Max Planck and a lot of, uh, they started discovering more and more about quantum physics, what we would call quantum physics. And what they discovered was, nowadays they call it entanglement, but they just discovered that a particle here in time and space and a particle over there, they seem to be connected, even though huge, huge distances of time and space were between these particles, the particles were doing the same thing. What's the term? Spooky? Spooky action at a distance. Spooky action at a distance. It was spooky to Einstein that there was that much connectivity in such broad time and space. But Jesus would probably just laugh and go, no, it's not spooky at all. It's just, <laughs> it's isness. <laughs> it's just what is. It's just everything is connected. Everything is way, way, way more connected than humans are aware of. The butterfly effect, some people have heard and read about the butterfly effect, how that's connected. It loves, I love seeing that in different movies and things that come out. So in terms of your own life, do you have any questions or curiosities or any kind of topics or issues or anything you'd Another like question to about explore? guidance and like, what if you don't like you obviously hear the voices in your head, and but what if you don't hear the voices in your head? How, how do you how do you follow guidance without the, the voice? Well, I know for me it was it started off with feeling. Mm. I had to, I was out of touch with my feelings, mm. and Jesus was like, well, there, here's where we start mm. to to become much more in touch with what I was feeling, because I. I don't know, I just got so repressed and so out of touch with feelings that it, it, my life felt very boring and robotic and mechanistic, like a lot of people mm -hmm. feel. And that's where 
it started for me. I don't know about you, but well, I guess guidance is such a. Um, I can't even say emphasize. Is 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 how we live. It's everything for us yeah. to be, you know, living a life of guidance. And I guess for me, um, you know, it's not an end as. It is a means for me, you know, like it becomes something that I would desire so much. And I notice the difference of wanting to achieve that end result. And sometimes I can forget, you know, how important it is even just to get into that direction in everything that I do, to have a direction of wanting to ask for guidance in the first place, whether I believe I can hear it or not at the beginning. You know, it feels like to me, what I noticed was the most important thing is the desire of hearing it, and the desire of hearing it would manifest or reflected by my actually asking or not. You know, in that I can see how strong the desire is actually is, and with if I desire it so much and I really put that into practice and I ask, I notice. It's always there. The guidance is becoming more and more clear. It doesn't really has to come as an audible voice. Actually, it can be quite rare. To so the suggestion is not to really put too much emphasis on one particular way that the spirit can speak with you. The so spirit is saying, you know, if you want, I speak with you in every way you can get your attention to. So I will catch your attention through anything. You're a friend you really trust that you feel you can relax, a you know bumper sticker or um, exactly, you know a music that that is you just suddenly started to tune into in the restaurant. I will talk to you as long as you start to remember to ask me, and I notice that is a huge turnaround for me. Actually, is this desire and put that into practice, then the feeling and the confidence started to build up. Oh my God, I can hear, I really can, and it's, he is speaking to me all throughout the day through all kinds of means. So, yeah, I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but I'm hearing now that that uh, one of the most helpful ways is is to. S- Start to honestly take a look at at the purpose and the motivation of why I don't want to hear guidance, and and go into that a bit, like uh, the fears around guidance, because uh, Jesus says things in the course in the workbook, like it is it is possible to listen to the voice for God all throughout the day without interrupt, interrupting your regular activities in any way. So he's making it plain and clear that it's not because your body's too busy or you're in a difficult location or whatever. He's saying no, it's it's actually quite easy to do that, but it's but there are interferences, and so for me, uh, that's why when people say to me things like I've I've studied the course for years, I know it's all an illusion, but and I say well you better you would rather flip it around and say. I believe it's all real, and <laughs> I'm willing to be shown. <laughs> Don't say I know it's all an illusion, but that's, we've talked a lot about metaphysical ghosting and, and oh gosh, course groups all over the world. You know, somebody starts to have an emotion in the group, it's an illusion, honey. It's, you know, you know it's, and then people dare not say what they're feeling because they've, <laughs> they've been told... <laughs> Get get back to the book. It's an illusion, you know. It, 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 this is metaphysical ghosting. This is is misuse of metaphysics. Jesus was had a three year public ministry, and never in the Bible, in the red words, did Jesus come to planet Earth and say that this world was an illusion anywhere in any of the Gospels. And he went around demonstrating things that were quite beyond this world, uh, healing the sick, raising the dead, and all, all manner of miracles, all manner of friendliness, all manner of, of love, but, but not going around doing what many Course of Miracles students do, is calling their parents up, their relatives, 
their neighbor. They've got to tell. Jesus didn't do that. Why? If Jesus didn't do it, why? What makes you think he would guide you to do it? You know, it's demonstrated by your attitude, by your happiness, by your joy, by your love, by your not taking things in the world so seriously, by being lighthearted and having a happy skip to your step. You know, that that's the way. But actually when you start to take a look at where in my mind am I afraid of hearing guidance? Because people will do that sometimes with their children, like, thank you very much Jesus, handle, you can handle my life, stay away from my baby, uh, stay away from my husband, stay away from my wife. I can handle the relationship stuff. Or the flip side is, I can't handle relationships up, but I can handle the finances. You stay out of my bank account. <laughs> don't go there. I don't even want to think about you being in charge of my bank account. Uh, or in certain cultures, the family construct is so strong. Like, here, you can lead me, guide me in my vocation, and guide me in this and this. Don't you mess with my family. Don't you mess with my family. People will go around with the early lessons of the Course. Nothing I see means anything. They go around, they get to the family photo, and skip right over that. <laughs> go on to the next thing. That, when you find yourself doing it, when your eyes move quickly over the family photo to the rug or something else, the floor. Yes, that floor does not mean anything. <laughs> You've got to pay attention to what you're skipping over. Because that lets you know where you're afraid to hear the guidance. Mm-hmm. Think of that in terms of relationship. You know, it's like, do you really want the Holy Spirit and Jesus inside of your, in terms of your relationship? Because what the Bible said was, let your yea be yea and let your nay be nay. Are you prepared to do that with your significant other? To always let your yes be a solid yes? And always let your no be a solid no, with no quivering, no wavering, even in the face of a look, a glance, a, what did you say? (laughs) I don't think I heard you clearly there. You know, you have to come into a confidence with the Holy Spirit, so your yes can be yes and your no can be no. But we know from Jim Carrey's movie, Yes Man, that yes won't get you there. I tried that. You tried that. We've all gone that round where we try yes, 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 and wham, we get slammed. We get body slammed from all those yeses. We have to have just as much confidence in the Spirit's no's. And we need to say no when we need to say no and yes. So, if you really or start to be honest, and I think this is a fast way to tune into guidance, even if you're not hearing or feeling anything, if you start to look at where am I afraid to hear divine guidance. I mean, I've even, people are afraid of divine guidance, but they're they're afraid of apparitions. Robert was telling us of the Mother Mary apparition. It was the he's going to there was an apparition of the Madonna long after the Bali bombings. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that story. It was about 2000 and, 2005, around that time. And the, the Madonna appeared along the boardwalks up there in Coogee, and that's where the Bali bombing, there was a whole group of people that had gone to mm. Bali and they were killed, Australians that were killed, and a lot of them came from the Coogee area. Mm. And then shortly after that, there was all this kind of kerfuffle that Mary was appearing on the boardwalks up there. And I was doing an internship at the Sydney Morning Herald at the time, and they sent me <laughs> to do a story and interview all the Christians who had come to see the Madonna and I went along and I started to all these people from varying faiths and Marianite Christians and women in veils and all sorts of people had come with such devotion and faith and and of course the newspapers were laughing at it but I went along and I saw it and I saw that apparition whatever it was I saw what they said and it was just a very faint outline of the Madonna yeah. and so it was a really beautiful kind of symbol of, of, of just devotion yeah. and love Similar yeah, um, and, and for healing because of the Bali bombings for Australians, which was huge. Yeah, yeah for some, it, it's just that they're, because of their faith, because of where their minds at, that that an apparition can be such a 
a healing symbol, such a comforting symbol. And then I'll have people to tell me, if Jesus or Mother Mary appeared to me in my bedroom, I would shit in my pants. I would, I would be terrified uh, if I had apparitions of visions coming, because they're, they're said it's so out of pattern. You know, it would be like that. And then what you can start to say is, well, again, those are just symbols. So if there's any fear that I have in my mind, even about Jesus appearing at the end of my bed, anything, then I have to take a look at, I have to go inward and expose that fear. It's not going to do me any good to just fear a certain outcome in the world. And so that's one of the things that I would say is, is uh, for years I've just been joining with people, joining with people very deeply at, at looking at what frightens you. Uh, and oftentimes it's loss of control or perceived loss of control um, or the, you know, the standard rejection, abandonment, the things, you know, why wouldn't you let your yes be yes and your no be no in in intimate relationships. Why is there such a lot of game playing that goes on in these very close relationships between parents and children and partners? There's a huge amount of game playing. We can't project it on all onto the politicians and, and say it. There's a lot of deception that goes on there. What is it that I'm afraid of? And I think that would also lead us into that, why am I fear, fearful of the Holy Spirit? And here fearful of hearing the Spirit, because it's almost like there's a sense like, wow, if, if I was in total, full communication with everyone and everything, that there's some kind of threat. How many movies have been made where you see the main character and they've got something going on here, and then they've got something going on in another aspect of life, and they don't want those two scenarios to be brought together. The entire movie is based on them avoiding those people or those scenarios coming together and at the end of the movie all hell breaks loose when he finds out about her and she finds out, you know, and, and they call that entertainment and they have another great movie based on the formula of hiding and protecting and then certain situation unveiling something that that is highly guarded and protected. We need to start to be honest and say why would I protect anything from the Holy Spirit's healing light if that's how I'm going to wake up to eternity is by not hiding and protecting anything from the Spirit which areas am I hiding and protecting where is there embarrassment even a mild embarrassment you know Jesus tells us embarrassment is a form of fear and this need not be. So even areas where we feel mildly embarrassed, those are good inroads to drop down into that, that guidance. So I think to me that's very practical. I was, in the parable of David, David was extremely shy, voted most quiet in the senior class, a wallflower, just, I, I preferred to just blend into the walls and be totally unseen and unheard and then Jesus comes up with what? Go around the world 40 countries and you know it, it just he's like no that, we'll handle that I'll handle that shyness bit uh, and then we'll get on to important business <laughs> we've got some, the father's business to attend to so this shyness is not I even read Gandhi's autobiography and it, it helped to read how shy Gandhi was because I was like, I admired Gandhi so much, but then I'm reading the autobiography, and it's like, he was a really a shy child, like David seemed to be. He was a shy teenager. At one point, he was hanging with his friends, and his friend took him to a brothel. And all Gandhi thought was, hmm, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> Just <laughs> starting to tap into that intuition, you know, even as a teenager, you know, like, is this really where I'm supposed to be? You know, if that's the kind of thing we need to do. We need to tap into that intuition. That's going to carry us all the way back to heaven, back to nirvana. So the sooner we can tap into that, the better. 
and people talk about being logical and rational and everything. Well, to be intuitive and to be guided by the Spirit, there's nothing more important than that. And also people are concerned about giving up their rationality for all those that, that value rationality and step-by-step -step logic. And you hear people sometimes say, get out of your head and give up your logic and everything. Jesus says that the Spirit is completely logical. It's basically based on what assumptions you have. So the, the Spirit's plan, the Holy Spirit's plan is completely logical in waking you up. But his, his premise starts from a completely different premise than the ego. The ego's premise is fear and all of its logic flows from fear. The Holy Spirit's premise starts with love and all of the Holy Spirit's convincing and logic comes from love. So we don't even have to lay aside logic. You can follow your heart and be logical. How's that? <laughs> you can forget this left brain, right brain craziness. You're not a brain. And the brain doesn't even think. So don't be so concerned about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. The mind tells the body what to feel. It tells the body what to think. The mind is where it's all at. And of course, if you like Eckerd and Muji and some of those, I can sit with you for a few hours and retranslate. They're teaching the same things, but they're using a little bit different terminology. But I can tell the difference. I, I know what people are all speaking of and speaking in presence from their heart, but they have a little bit different system than Jesus. But it's just words. You can easily, the Spirit can easily tell you what, what's going on. It doesn't, it's not about semantics. Semantics are not a block. Sometimes people will say, well, uh, you and I, we don't have the same words. Well, we got the same eternal life. <laughs> that's, that's good enough. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Well, I did the other way on what you just said. I know what Moody is talking about. So I've been brought up or been yes. studying uh, the spirituality yes. in Vedanta way. And yeah. I picked up the course in Miracle Book early this year. I did not see any, you know, conflict there. That's yeah. why I was so easy with it. Yeah. I'll read any text, any lesson, and I'm absolutely in line with with my Vedanta thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I Beautiful. can tell you that now because I've read both. Yes. There isn't any, it's just that one says Christ, other one says Krishna. Both start with Krat. It is easy. And Krishna, it was the translation. And, and the word Krishna, kra, the word kra in Sanskrit means the one who scrapes you. Scrapes, <laughs> scrapes. So it kind of scrapes your mind and purifies your mind. Yeah. That's, what, that's what the meaning of the word kra is. Kra. The one who purifies, right? No, no problem. You can pray to kra. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I love about you Aussies. You short, make short nicknames for everything. <laughs> Even for Christ. Glory be to Krupp. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I tell something to everybody? Before we start, though, we, Mel has given me the signal that we've got all these uh, great goodies out. So we'll start with your thing. But, but the thing is, we've got all these, Robert's put out all the goodies, and we, it's probably good to take a little bit of a break. Potty break, <laughs> chips, <laughs> you know, have some drinks. There's water, there's all kinds of things. Okay, well, welcome back. Welcome, welcome. So, just thought I'd mention about some of the resources we have. We've got a whole resource table here. There's a lot of different books by David, which are just amazing, really. I think a lot of you might have seen him on YouTube and what have you. And The books, uh, David's never really written a book, he likes to say. <laughs> it's been a, a lot of people that have been really resonate with his teachings that have felt to transcribe the teachings into books, and there's... So there's various books there that have been put together. Uh, you know, when some of the latest ones, for example, Quantum Forgiveness is bringing together the teachings of Jesus through A Course in Miracles, uh, movies, and physics. So going with quantum physics, movies, Jesus, it's a pretty amazing sort of conglomeration of, uh, of information there. Um, one of the latest books we've just produced is Kirsten. So Kirsten was with David during the, the mid-2000s and did all these 
journals asking the spirit about all this stuff that was coming up for her while she was with David. The, it's an amazing journey of her going through awakening, really, with David. I Married a Mystic, it's called, so that's a, that's a great book. So there's plenty of other ones there. There's all different things we can join on. Uh, there's the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlighten, which a lot of people like. We use movies for, for the backdrop for awakening. And it's, you know, to be able to watch movies instead of just for entertainment, to actually use it for our awakening is, is really a very useful use of the movie. So it's a great guide for that. It's also online. And on this, uh, this there's a great little card. If you want to pick up one of these from the table, it's just got a number of the different websites. And MWG, MWGE.org is a great website. That's the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. So it's online as well as in book form. And there's plenty of other websites there which are great, besides David's YouTube channel. You know. So we actually have a community. We've got communities all around the world uh, with Living Miracles, part of David's communities. And there's one in Australia here that a lot of people don't even seem to realise. We're just about four hours west of here in Mudgee. And we just had a retreat there that just finished yesterday, a week-long retreat with about 40 people, which was an amazing experience. Some of them are here, so which is great. People <laughs> just following us around from the... Uh, went to the Melbourne conference, then came to Mudgee, and then here tonight. So that's just that's exactly what I did. <laughs> that's what a lot of us did. I know Francis did, and so did Melanie. And, uh, well, that was some years ago for me, and I'm, I'm still here and <laughs> absolutely loving it. So that's the card, if you want to see that on the table. Uh, it's got the website there, ACIM Australia. Um, and just about Utah, we've got a, a monastery in Utah. It's the only A Course of Miracles monastery. And this is the mystery school. It's our very first mystery school we're doing. It's a whole month live-in, 30-day event in uh, May next year. So that brochure is on there too if you want to see that. Which you is in want Utah. To, in Utah, yeah. We also have this mailing list if you want to find out about keep up to date with the newsletters. We've got a monthly newsletter. It's got some great information and events that are coming up. You just put your name on there. And, you know, we work with Divine Providence. We're all about getting and just working with the spirits at the spirit and using the, any of the funds that come in to be able to come out and actually get these works out and for people to know about them. So your donations are very <coughs> greatly accepted. So we've got a little donation box there if you can put that in there if you haven't bought any cash we've got the computer there if you want to log in online so we can do that too so okay thank you i also want to just mention that michael and melanie they are um, based in maji and they're very available to you know to to come to sydney whenever there is an invite because um, we work with invite and, and we really the community come together um, as like a support because we our purpose is to wake up together to hear the Holy Spirit together to to learn how to give over surrender our daily decisions and daily life so we come together with this one purpose and uh, different communities started to happen because of the calling of the region and things just happen so Australia Center just came together I think last year so it's, it's been here for a year and, and Melanie and Mel they're both from Australia and they, they felt called to come back here from Utah and to head over this, this uh, community so if you feel to visit and stay and just <laughs> to watch and observe how they, they use you know their relationships and daily life to, to practice listening to the spirit you're very welcome to contact them or just uh, you invite them to come down to Sydney, you know, for for more talks and gatherings and and um, experience that they can share of their miracles as well. They're married, so they're using relationship for all this clearing as well. It's very deep and profound. Mm. Yeah. And Samuel's going back over to New Zealand, so they're open to coming over there to visit. <laughs> They're wide open. Yeah. I love all the connections too because uh, we were talking today, we were walking down by Kuji Beach and, and Robert was opening up that his family heritage is from Malta. Oh, and I said, Malta? Michael. And Michael's family heritage is from Malta. And he said, yeah, I, my sister and I are actually part inheritors of a, of a big property that's right on the waterfront in Malta uh, and with 30 other people and it's been in, it's been in probate 
for how many years? 30? <laughs> Since the 60s. <laughs> but I love all the connections, you know. We always keep saying, oh, woo, all these, the Spirit just makes all these fun connections. So. Okay, well, you were going to raise something up right before we took a break. Um, I just um, started the, your worksheet to peace, is it? Instrument for Instrument peace. Instrument for peace. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's, it's awesome. I've, like, I've done some Byron Katie work, and it actually made Byron Katie's worksheet a lot more clearer mm. because I actually found myself spiraling a little bit with her worksheet in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, and I guess it sort of left me with the same, um, a little bit the same conclusion, like how deep do you have to go? And I guess the other part of that is I watched a talk on you saying that don't just question your um, the things that like um, upset you, but also question the things that you that you think bring you joy as well. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try that. And that sort of led down a whole different rabbit hole because I've never tried that. I've always tried to fix the upsets. Like, <laughs> and... Um, and then I, I was thinking, so do you get to a point where um, you just make the decision? Like, is it, a, is it a holy instant where you make a decision just not to, I don't know, um, desire anymore? Or, you know what I mean, have those desires be blocks anymore? Like, um, yeah, that's the direction. I could clarify that too. It's not, I never have made it an instrument uh, for questioning your joy. Uh, the, the one experience that we have when we have that intrinsic joy that's just bubbling up, that, that doesn't need to be questioned because that's a glimpse of what is, loving what is, as Byron Katie would say. But, but pleasure and pain are both inventions of the ego. So when I had the early students, I did mention to them I, the instrument for peace, and I subtitled it uh, like healing your upsets or something, and that was like a subtitle. And then I worked with students for years and years and years, and then finally they were like, is, could, is there anything else that could help us? And uh, I said, well, if, if you really want, I, can, I will tweak the instrument for peace healing your upsets for healing the pleasure and the, the, the point of it is that the ego invented a very dualistic uh, system to block joy, actually to block intrinsic joy from awareness which is just our God-given creative experience and um, you might remember in the course there's this line where Jesus says all real pleasure comes from doing God's will which is really lining us back to the guidance thing again about tuning into the guidance because we we have it's a deep rabbit hole but the only way uh, that we make it down the rabbit hole kind of in a rapid way I mean meditation will take you there and contemplation and there's a lot of uh, very helpful ways that have been developed by saints and mystics and avatars throughout the centuries but guidance is a is a very very direct way, and it's also very practical with with partners and children and houses and what seems to be the complexities of the Western world and and urban living and whatever. It seems to be completely different than what have been traditional pathways. Like if you went to India, they would say you're in the householder phase, you know, where Jesus doesn't make the distinction. He doesn't say, oh, you're a householder. He just says here we'll start working these lessons and we'll go and the instrument for peace and so forth and we'll go down there but ultimately that making that contact with spirit and and tuning into that guidance and following that guidance that's that is a very rapid way into spiritual awakening and it it takes us beyond anything that we can kind of imagine or fathom but as Francis was saying that's basically been our pathway that we join a lot. We don't have long, long periods of meditation. Um, at times, many of us in, in the community have been guided to hermitages or to go off and so forth. But, but generally, we are we use the Course in Miracles and we use the workbook lessons. We use the path that was given us, including relationships and and the use of the Course to tap into that guidance. 
And then as we follow that guidance, listen, follow, listen, follow, it builds the joy, it builds our contact with that joy, that inspiration. And then the more we are inspired, the easier the whole thing turns. Yeah. And that's really been the key for us. Yeah, I've done a lot of meditation in the past, and I've got three kids now. It's just one of them. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just not that option for me. So doing the worksheet mm-hmm. is more practical mm-hmm. to yeah, yeah. go because I don't have that go off in a room. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great that you mentioned even Byron Katie because I was crisscrossing with Byron Katie and, and her students over the years because we've all around to many, many different countries. And then uh, one of my students at one point um, started to make composites of Instrument for Peace and Byron mm-hmm. Katie workshops and really tweaking. Yeah, because the, most would be together because her brilliant question is what would you be without this thought? Mm-hmm. And um, your one is at the end is, <coughs> is worth, um, I can't remember because I just started doing the is peace of mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Would you have this desire instead of peace of mind? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, those are two both brilliant. Like, yeah, straight yeah. away, just the question itself was like, oh wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's very practical. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Okay. I've got a question. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a hard one, but. Just say you've been guided not to be around someone. I don't know, I'm just out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's not that easy, but you might be related to them, so yeah. Yeah, it's that, tricky. It's really tricky. Yeah, that's the thing where it's trusting that the spirit knows best in that sense that uh, you know, you sometimes even see that flash across Facebook uh, that just when people start to disappear from your life, don't assume <laughs> that, that that's a bad thing, that, that yeah. the Spirit will remove people from your life and, and things from your life that, that would be a, a distraction or uh, it could be a delay maneuver at, at times. So we have to be just as willing for things to disappear from our dreamscape as we are for things to appear. And oftentimes, you know, it says when, when God closes one door, God opens a window. Uh, it really works that way in the sense that that's why we have to be so surrendered, because things can get shut off, blocked, blocked, blocked by the Spirit, just so that we'll be channeled to open, open, open. And, and we can view those things as things falling apart, falling away, shutting down, when actually that's the ego interpreting yeah. And and really, spirits just saying here, I want you to go in this direction. So it's quite a, an interesting prospect when you when you're going along and certain things are getting removed. And there's even one of the stages early on of the development of trust in the manual for teachers, where Jesus says, "It will seem as if things are being taken away from you." So when Jesus comes right out and uses those words, taken away, seems, then he says really that's not what's happening, but it's just that, that the mind is starting to devalue some of its idols, which is making way for the glory, and the ego interprets that in terms of loss, as it always does. Yeah. Oh, why did you take this out of my life? Why did you take that? It's really that everything's going beautifully. And your mind is integrating and and coming, consolidating its its learning and practice, and and yet the ego is is trying to make a sad story. Mm, I think um, I'm past the I'm okay with it, but it probably you know you talked about the guilt. It's like there's that ego guilt, I don't, and even though I know it's positive, mm-hmm. like I have a sense of calm about it. Yeah, that it's okay and it's like I've got peace with that, but. There's a, it's a, a guilt of me not reaching out to them. Mm-hmm. It's not logical, it's just, mm-hmm. you know, and so you're just saying that's a guilt, that's a ego thing. When it, I sense that it's, it's, it's actually part of, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, well, what helped me, I when I went through Sitting some with of the, the, you know, when I went through that and I started to still feel this guilt hanging on, I remember that, that's I, me, you know, yeah, that's I not, popped up at the book and I opened to that part about, uh, back in the manual 
Yeah. Where the question is put to Jesus, uh, what are the levels of teaching? And uh, he basically starts out by saying, really, you know, there aren't any levels. <laughs> that we're always teaching and learning, and our thoughts are teaching and learning based on what we're thinking. That's what we're. That's what our relationship is. We. It's a relationship with our with our thoughts. Even though we think there's external people and external objects, external world, really, it's we're always relating to ourselves in a mind level. Yeah. But but then he throws out three levels because he knows it's like there really are no levels, but I'll give you three. <laughs> like, I'll give you something right, because we need them. We need them and we gotta chew on something for a while while we until we realize there's not there aren't levels. So and the second level is a, a fairly intense teaching learning situation in which the two appear to separate. Yeah. And I love that when he says, appear, yeah. ooh, yeah. here, thank you. Because the guilt starts to loosen right away. When you, the guilt is like, ah, we've separated. And then the appear is, don't mm. think you know exactly what's going on because you just appear to separate. But then even better, a guilt washer he gets the power washer off and he says, each one has taught and learned the most that they can and the teaching learning is maximal. Maximal? <laughs> Woo! Bring in the power washer. Let's get that guilt out of there because there's always in these kind of relationships the ego is going to throw the regret card in. <coughs> oh, if you just had hung in there a little more, if you just, you know, and he's got to get the power washer out. No, I said it's maximal. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> that feels good. <laughs> Again, right, right over here too. <laughs> because the, there's that, oh, coulda, woulda, shoulda. It's all those love stories. Oh, if only da da da. da and I can't live if living is without you. Can't give, can't give. Any, you know, it's, it's it's all these sad songs and everything. And it's all this guilt. But you know, maximal means maximal. That, that we're going to have these kind of relationships in our life. And admittedly we've been we've been addicted to codependencies, we've been addicted to these special relationships where I can't live without this one and I can't even imagine what my life would be without you in my life and all this song, love song, ha <laughs> ha codependent love songs. And yet we get to the point where Francis loves to talk about, she's seen how the Holy Spirit and Jesus have used relationships in my life, because they're all collaborative. Uh, when I'm going to use this, let the voice for God speak through me, uh, yeah, Jesus is like, yeah, I'll do that, and you have to have a supporting cast of characters <laughs> that will have a whole support team in there too. It's more like a choir. Not like, you're not like the lone wolf crying <laughs> out in the desert like the old, remember the old uh, ones from the Bible, you know, Ezekiel or, you know, all out there, John the Baptist, you know, repent, you know, crying in the dark. It's, no, you have a whole chorus that's going to come and join you. So I didn't even, as David, didn't like to travel. And then I get sent to over 40 countries. Uh, I speak one language, and then there's a lot of different languages in these countries. So Jesus sends in support cast. Uh, all kinds of translators, the best translators in the world, without even having to arrange it, happen to show up in the group, happen to relate to my metaphors. And even if they can't relate to my metaphors, there's somebody in the audience that cries out, you know, it's almost like group, group translations happen. It's like Pentecost. You know, there's, uh, <laughs> where I'm wondering how they're going to understand that Jesus sends in a fleet. The first time I went to Argentina, I think I was down there a couple weeks, but I had, I think, 12 or 14 translators that spontaneously just showed up at the gatherings. So that that's another form of relationship. You know, when you're down in Colombia and you don't speak Espanol and you're down there, it's, you've got to rely on JC Central to uh, send in some casting of, of those translators because there's no way you're going to, it's going to work without the translators. So I have swirls of translators that come around me. It's fun. Woo. 
and sometimes they're telepathic, so we've never met, but we get in this room and we're sitting in the same chairs and, and it comes through like this. And sometimes we're so tuned up that we're like two radio channels where it's coming through here in English and over there in Espanol. That's cool. Where it's like going simultaneously, but not that, that like this. It's going like this, like two speakers. And people in the audience are going, you know, which, which station do I tune into? You know, the English ones go here and the Spanish ones go there. You know, it's... That's it. And also with travel, you know, it's not a typical uh, assignment to go around and around the world. Francis and I, we quit counting how many times we've gone literally around and around the world. We go around the world and we're in the hotel and we both hear, here we go again. And she spends an afternoon booking flights for another. If we've just finished going around the world, she's like over there and there's the tickets and off we go again for another 360 around the world. It, it comes in fast, it's given, but also with, with travel partners, with every single thing, it's very orchestrated to what will bring a blessing to the whole. And that's just not, we're, we're not used to thinking of our relationships of what will bring a blessing to the whole. We're usually just focused on the partner, you know, and, and I mean focused, like we're, we've, we've got some major people pleasing going on there because Number one, once we find a partner that we feel compatible with, we're terrified we'll lose that partner. And if we have a partner we're not compatible with, we're trying to plan the escape. Uh, how do we get out of here? <laughs> where's the escape hatch? You know, like James Bond, where's the button? The eject button. You know, you know we've been in those relationships where you're in and you're going along and you're thinking, where's the eject button? <laughs> Quick. <laughs> because... You feel like you're going off the cliff, <laughs> like James Bond. <laughs> Quick, but we need to escape. Because this is the way the ego works. You know, it's either attracted or it's repulsed, and, or both. And it, it's quite sticky and quite tricky with these interpersonal relationships. But as we get more into alignment, then we're like, what serves the whole? We're open to, to expansive views of relationship. Someone shows up and they sing at your gathering and everyone is blessed. Someone so shows up and they have a house to provide or something, a, a living room to offer like this with some snacks. And, and you see, it's quantum. Our mind's doing this. You know, it's not by accident that we're having this great experience here. It's like we've, at some level of our mind, we've, we've chosen it, even though it's a preference out of all the possible outcomes in the in history and in, in the cosmos, we've frozen down on a particular outcome. Some of you, does anybody know quantum physics and superposition? You know, superposition is it's all potentialities, and then we lock in on Robert's room, Robert's living room. We've locked in on Robert's living room for the night, out of all the potentials. And this is what the discoverer of the atom found out that that. That electrons and protons and neutrons and atoms aren't things. Atoms are potentialities. And then when you get into quantum physics, you see, oh, that's how it works. It's all just superposition. Did anybody ever see that movie, What the Bleep? Do we know? Remember the basketballs? All the basketballs? And then, zoop, and then zoop, the basketball that comes out out of all the potential locations of the basketball, out of all the potential locations in time and space. We've zoomed in tonight on this on Robert David's living room. <laughs> Amazing, and and it's the same with relationships where we start to when we start to zoom in and focus all of our attention on one particular body, whether it's this body or that body or these bodies or whatever. You see, it's a tiny configuration, and we need to pull the blinders off and say, "What potentiality do you have for me for my entire life?" for my entire usefulness, for the plan of awakening. We need to pull those limiting parameters off. Pull them back, pull them back, pull them back. See how happy? <laughs> when you pull them back, that's the happy sound that you get. Ah! Yeah. 
She's actually really quiet. This is the first time she's just really like vocal. Yeah. <laughs> she's giddy. She's giddy with happiness. Yeah. First. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Um, I suppose my, my brain's still at that maximum thing. I didn't yeah. get that 100%, like you said, ma- at the third step. Yeah. Third step. <laughs> well, there's there's three levels that he gives, but I was giving this, the number two. Number one is, is remember, he says there are no levels, but yeah, no levels. then he gives you the three. <laughs> And the first one is like casual encounters where you meet somebody walking down the street or you see somebody in an elevator or whatever. These casual encounters can seem to be very random. And here you are with Sydney, you know, if you walk down the streets of Sydney, you're going to have, you're going to, uh, your eyes will meet different ones. You'll be drawn to different ones. You may pause at, at a crosswalk and you may say something to somebody that these are not random. Uh, there is nothing random about this universe. Everything is, is extremely purposeful and it's all, you might say, in one sense, arranged or prearranged. And then the second level was the fairly intense teaching learning opportunity in which they appear to separate and the learning is maximal. What does that mean? It means that each one has taught and learned the most that they could. Oh yeah. yeah. And that's the maximal part. And there has some, there's something comforting uh, about that coming from Jesus. Because the ego has all kinds of coulda, woulda, shoulda, and you know, it's going to try to make a mess out of that. It wants to, to, to per- be portrayed as an actual separation, not a seeming one. And in which there was some unfinished business left. But as long as we're perceiving human beings as, as separate from our mind, then we're, we're pro- the ego is projecting its grievances and they're called human beings. So the human beings in time and space, when, when they're projected, as if they're external to the mind, are projected grievances. And that's why even when you have soulmates that come together, if I always use the story, after a couple of years, the soulmates wake up in the morning and go, What? You believe what? <laughs> you know, there's an unconscious thing that's popped up into awareness that is calling for forgiveness. It's calling for seeing the sameness, that we are the same spirit, we're the same soul. We're the same one, like Neo, you know, you are the one. That's, that's the only recognition that we need to experience. So, I'm glad you're bringing it up because that's is when there's a nagging source of guilt underneath there, it's, it's just that there's a higher purpose that still hasn't been fully grasped, but it's there. And he does say that about the third level, that you, you're given a lifelong uh, partner, and if they decide to learn it in this lifelong relationship, the perfect lesson is before them and can be learned. So it's more than a soulmate thing, it's a wake up from time and space to eternity. A lifelong relationship in, that, in which the perfect lesson is laid before them and can be learned. He does qualify it, he says this lifelong relationship, they may be hostile to each other, <laughs> perhaps for life. So he shoots down all <laughs> typical soulmates, <laughs> saying that he's like, don't just go too far with this, let me say. But it's described more in terms of, if they're really learn, ready to learn the perfect lesson, they, they may have to go through a lot of intensity and a lot of darkness. But the purpose is to wake up from the darkness and go to the light. Perfect love casts out fear. To welcome the Holy Spirit into the relationship so fully that it's a lifelong relationship, and they do, they get it. They pop through to the light. A little bit like Gary Bernard's Artman and Persa, you know, popping through to the light in that metaphor. <laughs> Celebration! <laughs> David? Yes? What would you say to someone who is facing a physical challenge? and maybe an incurable disease, or maybe just short-term headache, or anything like that. Um, what would be the Course in Miracles perspective on that? Well, 
it's come to me sometimes. I mean, I we've had a recent uh, the past uh, couple of years we had a devotional where somebody came diagnosed with cancer, you know, with a terminal diagnosis, and then went through the, the six week devotional and completely beyond that they popped through and transcended that that whole perception and interpretation. I have had those that have come where, for me, it's always I go into prayer, and then in the prayer, things will pop out of my mouth like uh, a minister that uh, I was training for many years ago with hospice. We were both going through hospice training together, and he went out to have a burger with me at Wendy's and said that he'd been diagnosed with... with uh, it was like leukemia, it was like a cancer in the, in the lymph nodes. And then when we prayed together at lunch, I just was given the words, uh, is there somebody you haven't, who you, is dear to you in your life that you're not speaking with? For some reason, you've spl- split off communication with, and he's like, oh yeah, it's yeah, my, my sister. And so then the guidance came through to call call his sister and to open up and everything and then he did go through a, re- a complete remission. Uh, the doctors couldn't find a trace of the cancer. And it helps to remember from Jesus that all illness is mental illness. Mm-hmm. And so there's a mental block, there's a grievance. My grievances hide the light of the world in me. That, that it's never physical, even though it may appear to be, and be interpreted to be a physical ailment or physical thing, but it's it's always mental and it's always a grievance. And that's why when we do those workbook lessons, we, we come through with honest searching where Jesus will say, think of one who, who displeased you, who offended you, whatever. You have thought of him now. You know, he's seen that. <laughs> it's going to be quick. You know, the, the grievance is not that far from the surface. And then he does a whole guided meditation of, of seeing them in light and, and, and working to seeing the Christ in them, which is another great way of, of removing the, the grievance. So that's the most important thing for me is always this awareness that, that all illness is mental illness. And, and then that brings us back to look at, at our thoughts, pay more close attention, and tune into prayer for specific guidance. Robert Varley, some people, we were just talking about Robert Varley and, and Barbara, and the early pioneers with the course. I think one time I was talking to Robert and he was down in Texas where, where they lived quite a lot of their life and uh, he, he got this, uh, this really strong toothache and he really had this strong toothache and then when he went into prayer and meditation um, he was waiting to hear which dentist Jesus would take him to or, you know, what Jesus would have him do to handle the toothache. And, his, and Jesus said, go fly to Oregon and visit your father. And he's like, for a dental, for a, a throbbing dental pain, take a flight to visit my father? That's where the grievance was. Jesus took him right out of the dental pain without a dentist. He took him right to his perception of his father and going and visiting him and they had a wonderful healing joining and the dental the pain went away. You see how different it is from the surface of things. Uh, we were just talking during the break about a, an eye thing which Helen Schuckman, um, she was a research psychologist at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City and uh, one day she went blind. She lost vision in both eyes and uh, they took her across the, the street to a neurologist who did, ran all kinds of neuro- neurological tests, found nothing, still couldn't see and she finally goes back and then she goes back to Jesus again. That's, you know, you're dick- taking down his course, you can ask a few questions here and there like, what is going on with this I lost, I'm, what's going on with this blindness? And Jesus said, you're afraid of spiritual sight. You're afraid of spiritual vision. You see, it has nothing to do with neurology. It has nothing to do with sight, even in this world. It 
everything in form simply is a reflection of what's going on at a much deeper level in mind. And that's why when we study a course, we're on a journey into our mind. We, The ego tried to project out a world where we get so distracted with bodies and brains and hearts and all kinds of physical stuff that we would we would be mindless. The ego always wants us to be mindless. It wants us to be so focused on the brain and the body and the world and, and events and circumstances. Oh, the election, did you hear the one? Oh my God, I can't believe the one. Did you hear this? And, oh, and pollution is getting so bad. I went to this city. And, you know, it's, it's always trying to scare us with the projections and keep us good and scared so that we won't sink inward to the mind and to our thoughts and beliefs, which is where all of our problems, our seeming problems are. They're just erroneous thoughts that come from erroneous beliefs. And until we get to the bottom of the barrel and we start to re realize how silly that these are not real thoughts, and these aren't even real beliefs, then it seems like we're just acting and reacting to images on the screen, like when we go to a movie. Someone says, how was the movie? Oh, it was a horror movie. It was a scary movie. My heart was pounding. It's just shadows. <laughs> shadows and sights and sounds, but, but we interpret ourselves as being identified with the character or characters of the situations. Do you realize that there has never been in, in all of history a frightening situation that the ego has projected out all of these hallucinating situations and that there really aren't, they're all simultaneous, they're not even linear, but they're all, they all happened at once and now it pulls out all these, oh that scared me, and then that scared me, oh that's a terrifying memory, oh I, I was afraid of this, I was afraid of that. Jesus says, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. Really? Is it that bad? I mean, I didn't get any right. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not saying in most, in most, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. How humbling is that? And then people say, that's hard to believe. But in the end, there aren't even separate situations. But we've got a time issue going on. The ego invented linear time and it strung these crazy scenes and scenarios together like a movie. Remember the old movie theaters where they have the film with all the different and it goes so fast that it makes the illusion that it's actually happening when it's just a bunch of photos. We're just watching a bunch of shadows with photos and the recorded sounds and then we're interpreting that all these real things are happening. That's why we're reacting and responding in the movie theaters, because we're interpreting that there's some reality going on, on that screen. We've forgotten we're dreaming. We, forgot it. we forget when we're even watching a movie. Who here in Sydney pays $30 for a movie and forgets that it's a movie? Everyone. Usually, most everyone. Until you get your mind trained to a high degree that you realize that, that everything in your daily life is as much as the movie is as you, when you go into the theater. It's all projection. Mind is caught in dreaming. It's inception. There's layers upon layers upon layers of dreaming until you forget that you're dreaming. And then, then you start to take those images very seriously. Are you saying Donald Trump is just an illusion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, the, that's our direction we're going. It's almost like saying, show me. You know, I need to be convinced. Show me. And then the Spirit does. The spirit does. hearing you talked about dreams or something, and that's just, there's no difference? Yeah. yeah. Freud had that part right. Freud said dreams were wish fulfillment. And so what seems to be our daily life is wish fulfillment, and what seems to be our nighttime dreams is wish fulfillment. <laughs> and uh, 
The only problem with wish fulfillment is if you have a death wish in your mind. That complicates things. Because those those dreams are not always so peaceful. They're sometimes called nightmares and or night terrors. Or in terms of daily life, a bad day. How was your day? I had a bad day. Or I had some bad things that happened to me during the day. I was going really good and then this happened and then this and this. And then it turns into a bad day. But but it's all wish fulfillment. So all I would say is be careful about what you wish for. Uh, because the mind is extremely powerful. And we have to be honest with ourselves about our wishes. And in the end we we have to expose the ego and see that we don't want it. I gave a talk in Edmonton, Canada years ago and I was only like five or ten minutes into the talk and a lady in the front row, an elderly lady, she just, just raised her hand right I just was getting rolling there and she said Wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. You've had nothing good to say about the ego. <laughs> you had nothing but negative things to say about the ego. Come on. And so I took a long drink of water, nice long sip, and I looked at her and I just said, the ego wants you dead. <laughs> and then I continued on with the, the talk. It's a death wish. We can't mollycoddle it, we can't love it, we can't cuddle it. It's a, it's a death wish. And the only thing you can do with the death wish is expose it and bring it from the unconscious mind into the conscious mind, where then you can see, I don't want this, and I don't want any aspect of this, and this thing doesn't want me good, so I, therefore I will pull my mind's energy away from it. I will completely unplug from this puff, uh, this imaginary puff, because it's not serving me. So that's why we have this journey with the spirit that seems to involve this world, is, is to pull our mind completely away from it. As long as it seems to be valuable, then we spin. Mm -hmm. So just practice unplugging in yeah. Dream. Yeah. yeah. And and the way you do that is like with all your relationships, you you do cultivate gratitude because honestly, the relationships are showing you those dark spots, the, those hidden spots in the unconscious that are really buried, mm. and they're doing us a great favor, huge yeah. favor. Our pets, our dogs, our cats, our gerbils, <laughs> hamsters. <laughs> <laughs> hamsters, <laughs> horses, cattle, humans, every, everything is mirroring, reflecting back to us what we need to expose and release. Just name it, I don't want it, hand it over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so it's the choice of just saying I don't want that, yeah. not wishing for it. Yeah, yeah, exposing the wish. Yeah. Yeah, the only reason that idols seem attractive is because they seem to offer something of value. That's what an idol is. It's something that is make-believe, it's fictional, but it's been given value. It's been given artificial value. Like It's like the mind saying, oh, I really need nothing except for this. This would be nice, and this will bring me happiness, and then the idol will fall. And... Jesus says, seek not outside yourself, for it will fail, and you will weep each time an idol falls. That's our weeping. We've, we've misinvested, and then we think that we've lost something that's real. But God didn't give us something that can, be, can fall so quickly. It must be something artificial that we've raised up, you know, as something important, and then when it falls, or seems to fall, then we you know, can feel depressed. That's, I think with this election, yeah, there's been some reflections coming in, and people writing in, and we're very sad, you know, we're, we're grieving, and a lot of those kind of reflections are coming in, but, but in any situation, including an election outcome, 
the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and Jesus quietly whisper, this need not be. You, you need not be disturbed by this outcome or this interpretation. Give it to me. It, it, the Holy Spirit can reinterpret anything. In fact, uh, I remember reading some of the things in the Bible and I, I would read certain things in the Bible and I would say, that's just plain old nasty. It's just nasty. That's a nasty... Uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Oh, that's just plain nasty. It's a nasty thought uh, in the Bible. And then Jesus takes that one in the Course of Miracles and he, the Holy Spirit flips it around and says, vengeance... Is a, is a concept that doesn't belong in your holy mind. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Give it to me for healing. Vengeance is mine. You can reinterpret. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You could reinterpret everything. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, precisely. I can reinterpret anything into the light of, of truth. So we don't have to have our anger at certain things or maintain any kind of sense of distance. David, I remember when I was doing that whole oscillating, you know, for goodness, God knows how many years, and, and, and for me that oscillating was coming to terms with what was probably inevitable, but it's also the you know ego versus uh, God's time, like yours. You know, your will be done, not mine. And, and I was all, I was always very very clear of that. And I used to get really angry because sometimes you know I'd throw a card or I'd ask a question, I would I would get the resounding no that I didn't want to hear because I wanted it to be my time, not not um, not the time that was meant for me. And and that day. Only how many weeks ago through <laughs> oh, and and that voice that was so clear to me and so beautiful and so peaceful, you know, now's the time. And I'm like, What? Who are you? You know, that sort of feeling and and, and it had to say it three times. Mm -hmm. And then finally I went down and, and, and ended mm -hmm. this relationship with love, you know, after thirty one years and and I, I remember making a very very strong pact with self that I would not go down the road of guilt, that I would not go down the road of fear. I mean, I guess the, the bottom line is fear. So under that umbrella of fear is all sorts of emotions, you know, related to that. And, and, I've, and I've made a very strong decision not to do that. So it's great that you brought it up and it's great that you brought it up because it just reaffirms for me that, and that thing that you just wrote just now, I don't have to feel pain. I've already felt it. I've felt it for the last bloody ten years. You know, up and down, yeah. up and down, up and down. And it was always about the ego wanting it. And patience was never my virtue, but it is now. Because I had to be patient. And it, and it had to come from, from that real place. Because I knew that if it came from the ego, it, would be, it just wouldn't have worked. It just wouldn't have worked. Yeah. 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 I'm, glad. I'm glad you're both bringing up this relationship. Because oh. this is like... This is, can be like a sore spot where the ego seems to be very ingenious in pulling its cards and tricks in there to maintain guilt. And it's reminded me of a time I, I went to this small town in, in uh, Michigan, and uh, I think it was Brooklyn, Michigan, and, and I got invited by a friend of mine who was a lawyer who was into the course. He would draw people into his law office and... and people would come in to get divorces and he would talk with them and talk with them and they're ready to just get at each other and really go after and, and he would be pointing to sayings from the course that he had on his wall and I, I said oh this is the funniest thing a lawyer who's like a a Course in Miracles teacher, I said, I just, I just marvel at how Jesus <laughs> uses, like be a barrister, a, a solicitor, a lawyer who's working for Jesus. And anyway, I was to his place one time, and and I gave this talk, and I was, I was so excited and happy in giving this talk. And when this guy came up to me afterwards, and his name was Mike, 
and he said uh, during the first half of the day, I, he said there, he said, "Oh my gosh, my wife would love this talk. That's all she she's saying the same kind of stuff that you talk about all day long. Uh, I know if she was here, she would be just soaking it up." This is right up her alley and everything. So I said, good, good, good. Sometime you can bring her. Well, he goes home. He, he, I go back a year, a year later, and, and there he is. Mike's brought his wife this time. And she's sitting in the front row. She's got her little pen. And she's just like... She's, <laughs> and she's so happy. She's putting it all down. And, everything. and he goes, see, I told you. I told you. I told you. This is right up her alley. So then, another year goes by, I come back around, I come back there and everything, and, and I see Mike, I say, how's, how's your life and everything? He said, well, my dad died and my wife left me. <laughs> I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, they were the most, both of them were the most miraculous experiences I've ever had in my life. I said, well, how did it go? He said, well, I was there in the room when my dad died and I could feel all this love and I was like, he was with me even though his body wasn't moving anymore I could feel him in me and through me and around me it was mystical and my dad died and I felt like wow, that was amazing I've never seen, felt such a connection and I said, how did it go with your wife leaving? he said, oh, that was a tough one he said, uh one day I came home and she was there and she's like, I love you. I love you so much. She, he said, that's how it started. I love you. Like you said to you for I love you. And she said, and it's time for me to go. And he said, go? What do you mean go? Go where? Oh, I, I'm guided. I'm going to be going to Florida. That's where the Spirit's guiding me. That's my next thing. Well... Yeah, but what about us? And she said, it's been so wonderful. You've been such a beautiful partner in my life. And, and I love you so much. And he said, so he said, I said, what did you do? He said, oh, it was shocking. It was horribly shocking. And he said, I went down to the local bar and my friends. And I, got, I got the guys around me. I said, hey, my wife's really happy. And they said, that's not good. And, and, uh, and she's so happy that she's talking to me and she's leaving. Oh man, that's not, that is not right. That is not right. You need some counseling. You need the guys getting into counseling and da 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 da. We need to, she needs to see the light. You, know, you can't, you just can't walk out on your man. Stand by your man. You, know, you, you can't do that. And, and so they, they talk and everything. And he says, well, but she's so happy. <laughs> That's the part I'm not... She doesn't look unhappy at all. She's so happy. And so eventually, yeah, she just she just did. She said, here's my guidance. This is what I'm doing. I love you. I'll always love you. I have total gratitude. And she left. And he said, that was a tough one. He said, I went through all kinds of emotions of rejection, abandonment. You might imagine all the, the ones. But he said you know, wow, the Spirit is really working with me. He said, I went through a huge amount of healing when she left. More healing than I could have ever imagined. So we can't be the judge. We just have to follow our guidance. We have to, and we, we can't let the ego try to come around and whack us a few more times and beat us over the head with a few things. If, if we're to join with somebody, if we're to stay with somebody, if we're to leave somebody, it reminds me of the early days when I was traveling around uh, the United States and Canada for like five years, from 91 to 96, and I had those stay and go prompts that were coming to me like on a, every day or two or three days. Because I was, you know, Jesus is like, go, go there, stay, stay, leave. And if I tried to stay, when he said leave, I said, it's so nice here, it's a beautiful place, they love me, they're feeding me. <laughs> He's like, I'm feeding you. <laughs> but it's not that. And, you, and it was listen and follow, and then go, go, stay, stay, go, stay, 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 go. You know, it was so much practice, because when you're in a house, you really aren't thinking stay or go. 
You just turn on the light, okay, go shower, brush your teeth, you know, you, you think, I'm in my house or my apartment. Mm. But these stay and go things really were obedience lessons of the Spirit. Listen, follow. And I th we've had a lot of those being on the road a lot. Yeah. And also in the end, I mean, the, the three levels they talk about, is we, in our lives, used to be so much emphasis on the longest one, you know, like, after the three, you, you, the mind naturally passed the first one, ah, that's a, you know, random encounter that's not important, and the second, okay, it's a little bit of time element involved, and the third one is where the mind goes, okay, do I have that, who is the one, but I guess on this path, so much of listen and follow, because... The spirit eventually want us to have that kind of experience with everyone. The same kind of relationship.